Hello and welcome everybody to today's Saturday morning lecture, the last of five live stream events this spring. My name is Dr. Stanley Yen and I will moderate today's session. Was the start of life on earth assisted by the arrival of complex organic compounds from elsewhere in the galaxy? Today, we welcome Dr. Sun Kwok from the UBC Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences to give us his thoughts on this topic in a lecture entitled, The Cosmic Seeds of Life. In the live stream description, you'll find links to learn more about our speaker's career and accomplishments. Your questions for the speaker may be submitted via the chat box on the YouTube live stream. And so without further ado, I now turn the podium over to Dr. Sun Kwok. Hello, thank you, Stan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I try to address the question of where did we, where did, where did we come from? And also to try to present to you uh, some of the ideas that have developed recently in the astrobiological community. So, of course, the question of origin of life is a very old one, and almost all cultures have some ideas of, uh, or legends, uh, folklores about the origin of life, and uh, almost every culture have their own version of uh, uh, creation by some supernatural uh, beings. And uh, this uh, idea, uh, lasted a couple of thousand years until the scientific community began to think about uh, other alternatives. Now, one of the early ideas was that uh, there are life elsewhere in the universe and what we have on earth, we just transported from uh, somewhere else. Now, of course, this uh, theory does not really solve the problem of origin of life. It only shifts the problem to somewhere else. Now, for between the 15th and 19th century, it was also popular to believe that, that uh, life can spontaneously uh, arise from non-living matter. And there uh, are various uh, reasons to believe that because you can see worms coming up from decaying meat. And after uh, microorganisms were discovered, they were uh, seen to uh, seem to appear from nowhere. I mean, for example, from gravy, broth, and other uh, materials. Now, these uh, theory were completely put to rest in uh, 1850 by Louis Pasteur because he performed an experiment to show that all this life coming from nowhere is just uh, because of the contamination by air. So as of today, we believe that life can only come from life and not from uh, non-living matter. Now, with the development of chemistry, uh, chemists also realize that there are separate different kinds of molecules that make up our body. These biological molecules, they were believed to be different from rocks or uh, minerals and they, have, they process uh, certain unique quality, which uh, was called uh, vitality. Now that was uh, believed to be something which separates the living from the non-living. However, late in the 19th century, chemists were able to uh, artificially synthesize uh, various organic compounds from non-organic non com chemical compounds. So that eventually led to the demise of the concept of vitality. So organic molecules, uh, the molecules that make up uh, uh, living organisms actually can come from non-living. Now, but of course, having organic molecules is not quite the same thing as a living organism. So, so where did the life originate? So, Although we realize that life cannot come out from non-living today, but it might have been possible uh, in the distant past because uh, it, uh, in, in, 
billions of years ago, uh, the environment was different. We had a lot of time and uh, this idea was promoted by uh, Huxley and uh, it became more of a uh, uh, developed theory, uh, in particular in the Soviet Union, that uh, uh, origin of life is actually nothing but a chemical process. And so long we have the correct environment and some input of energy that uh, life can uh, uh, develop from the non-living. Uh, not now, but uh, billions of years ago during the early days of the Earth. Now, this theory was not taken seriously in the Western uh, community because primarily because primarily was done in the Soviet Union until 1953. So at the University of Chicago, there was a famous experiment, the Miruri experiment, which they put uh, some simple uh, organic uh, uh, simple, it's like methane and in organics like ammonia, water and hydrogen and put in an electric discharge and uh, after a few days, uh, quite unexpectedly, that they, you can detect amino acids, sugars and other organic compounds in this uh, simple apparatus. And uh, many similar kind of experiments have been performed after that and uh, almost uh, uh, like uh, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, I mean all the essential uh, ingredients of life can actually uh, be uh, produced in the laboratory uh, using sim this simple technique. So the Western uh, view of the origin of life had a complete shift uh, since 1953. So it's now commonly believed by the scientific community that uh, early in the uh, history of the earth that under suitable um, environment with some input energy, for example, lightning or whatever, that uh, uh, that's how life uh, developed. Now today I'm going to talk to you about a different possibility uh, due to the research that came out in the last couple of decades. Now this idea relies on two assumptions or two pieces of uh, evidence. One is that uh, now we realize that uh, very complex organic compounds can be made in cells, and I'll discuss uh, in detail later. And then this, uh, during the early days of the, of the Earth, there were large scale uh, external bombardments of the Earth, and uh, maybe a lot of these uh, early ingredients for life were actually delivered to us uh, through external processes. Okay. So now one of the first thing that, uh, or, uh, one of the things that I would like to illustrate is that unlike what we used to believe uh, not that long ago, uh, complex organic compounds is not only exist on earth, but they are common elsewhere in the universe. And that's very important that, uh, and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the next step uh, for this uh, new theory of origin of life is that uh, during the early days, the Earth might have inherited some uh, primordial organic materials uh, from stars uh, or elsewhere in the galaxy, and these later develop into uh, life that we have today. Now, so we talk about the second process first, which is the delivery. Now, we, we know that now that uh, the Earth is not a closed system. All you have to do is take a look at the Moon. The Moon is full of craters, and these craters were used to be uh, uh, just a, a hundred years ago, we believed to be volcanic in origin, but now we know that they are not they are due to bombardments by uh, comets, asteroids, and other uh, materials in the uh, solar system. And uh, these are all impact craters. So the, the moon was hit by a uh, whole bunch of external objects and those are the origin of the craters. So similar craters can be seen on Mercury can be seen on Mars. Now the Earth being a much larger body than the Moon uh, should have also been subject to such impacts. Now, and you can see that uh, the, uh, for, for example, the famous Arizona crater, and now although it was also believed to be uh, volcanic in origin uh, just a hundred years ago, but now we realize that this is a result of an impact. 
it's probably an, in, an asteroid about a kilometer in size that that uh, hit the hit the Earth and uh, and that uh, in the process release a lot of energy and creating this crater. Now, although we expect a lot of craters on Earth, but because of the erosion of the Earth, the Earth had gone through a lot of geo geological processes, mountain roads and uh, uh, continent shift and a lot of this evidence actually have been lost. Uh, today only about 200 craters uh, can be seen and this is one of the recently discovered one uh, in China. You can see that there is a village in the middle of this crater and is now recognized to be an impact crater. So now we do have other pieces of evidence of the of impact on Earth. For example, we know now the moon was uh, created uh, out of the uh, outer materials of the Earth by impact by a mass-sized uh, external object, and our oceans uh, uh, are brought in by uh, 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 ice uh, carried by uh, comets. Okay, okay. Now. The second point is that the materials that make up life. Now, since about the 1950s, uh, astronomers have recognized that the chemical elements that uh, we use in life, and we use uh, many elements, for example, we, our body needs uh, calcium, chlorine, chromium, copper, iodine, iron, magnesium, Many of the chemical elements are needed, are needed for various uh, biochemical purposes of our body. And uh, the origin of uh, chemical elements was not known until the 1950s. And it is now believed that except for a couple elements like uh, hydrogen and helium, all the elements that we have on Earth are made in st old stars. So actually uh, every piece of our body was once inside a star because all the chemical elements that make up the molecules and cells in our body were all manufactured in stars sometime in the past. Now when was uh, this uh, uh, nucleosynthesis happened? They happened uh, in the very late stage of a star's life. What well, we know in the case of the sun, the sun is maintaining its uh, brightness by uh, nuclear fusion of uh, changing hydrogen into helium. And we know that has gone on for four and a half billion years, and we probably will continue to do so for another five billion years. Now, after that, the sun will become a red giant and uh, at that stage that uh, those stars can begin to burn helium into, into, into carbon. And also through a variety of nuclear reactions can make all kinds of heavy elements. So these heavy elements are made in the interior of red giants and they were brought to the surface through the process of convection and then ejected into interstellar space. So in 5 billion years, the sun will become much larger, about 100 times larger than the present size reaching the orbit of Mercury. And it will fill the large part of the sky. So instead of two minutes for the sun to set, it will take two, three hours. So this is, uh, uh, imagine imagination of the future uh, landscape of the Earth. The sun is much bigger and of course, and much more uh, luminous. And of course, at that time, the surface is so hot that there will be no life uh, left. And uh, the interesting thing is that beginning in the uh, 1960s, astronomers discovered the evidence that uh, when a star is a red giant, he, is, he has a very massive stellar wind. Now we know that the sun has a solar wind, but the wind from an old um, red giant star is much, much more uh, powerful. For example, 
the uh, Standard Wing would carry 600 trillion tons per second, so about a billion times more uh, powerful than the current solar wind. Now, well, what is in that solar wind? That is what something that uh, uh, was really interesting. Now, after the development of the technique of uh, radio receiver working at a very high frequency. So for example, at a frequency of uh, uh, over 100 gigahertz, which is, uh, I mean, several hundred times higher than our cell phone frequencies. It was, it came as a surprise that uh, uh, molecules were discovered. Now molecules can be detected by astronomical techniques in several ways. So when a molecule rotate, it will emit radio waves in the, with the wavelength in the millimeter and submillimeter range. So when a uh, molecule, for example, CO is a linear molecule, it stretches, when it stretches, or it, when it bends like a water molecule, you can bend. And uh, when they undergo those motions, they emit uh, infrared light. Now with uh, the detectors uh, available in the infrared and the millimeter, some millimeter wavelengths, we, are, we have the capability of detecting molecules in space. So since 1970, over 200 molecules have been detected in space. Now, and that includes almost every class of organics, hydrocarbons, alcohol, acids, aldehydes, ethers. I mean, every class of organic chemistry have examples of molecules that are being detected astronomically. Now, people will say, well, you know, stars are and uh, nebulae are very far away. How can you be sure that you are actually detecting those molecules? The remarkable thing is that the techniques are so good that we can have uh, detections of the uh, lines radiated by this molecule with an accuracy of one in 10 million. So when we do detect a molecule, we have absolutely no doubt that we are actually seeing such molecule. Now, and that's really very interesting because I am old enough to, be, to know that uh, in the 1960s, uh, most astronomers uh, did not believe that this was possible. They say that the density in the, in the set of space is too low, there's too much of the violet light, it's impossible to have molecules in space. Now, contrary to the uh, expectations, we know we now have detected over 200 uh, molecules in the gas phase in the interstellar space. So, well, we don't quite know theoretically how it's possible, but nature is uh, smarter than us. Now, I want to concentrate on one aspect of this uh, detection of molecules, and these are the molecules which are manufactured by stars, in particular, a very old stars. Now, when you look at an old star, because they have this stellar wind, they are, you know that these molecules were being made right there, that they were ejected uh, after they're manufactured in uh, over very short time scales, namely 10,000 years. So over 80 molecules have been detected in the stellar wind of very old stars that includes organics, inorganics, radicals, rings, chains, and so on. Now, not these stars not only make molecules, they also make solids or minerals. And that was very surprising. In the 1969 at the University of Minnesota, uh, they discovered that uh, some of these very old red giants they have signatures of minerals. Now, uh, I show some examples here. The results that we work with the infrared astronomical satellite that uh, uh, is very common 
for uh, old star to make minerals such as silicates, which is similar to sand on the beach. So they, uh, they are manufactured uh, based on the uh, silicon and oxygen and like magnesium and aluminum atoms uh, in the set of wind of these old stars and they were ejected from, uh, from the stars. Now, as of today, we don't really have any good theory on how these uh, minerals could form because the density of the set of wind is very low. Actually, they are uh, lower than any vacuum that we could achieve in a laboratory on Earth. And, uh, but uh, nevertheless, we see that they form, they are not really they form, they, uh, they were uh, ejected from the stars. So we have a new uh, subject called stellar mineralogy. So all kinds of minerals, I mean, including something similar to uh, ruby and sapphire, I mean, have been detected in the stellar winds of stars. So, Stars are very powerful molecular factories. Not only they make more atoms, they make molecules, and they make minerals. Now, what happens when the sun dies? Now, at the very large stage of the sun's life, or actually other stars similar to the sun, the sun being a very typical star, and uh, the sun will become something called a planetary nebula, which lasts about uh, 20, 30,000 years. These are very spectacular objects. They are very bright and they are very colorful. And they are bright, uh, different from the, uh, how the sun is uh, being luminous. They radiate like a neon sign uh, uh, that we have uh, in commercial buildings. They radiate by uh, atoms, not uh, like a, a star which uh, radiate continuously. So these are examples of planetary nebulae. Now, the, why I mentioned planetary nebulae is that accidentally or unexpectedly, four graduate students at the University of Minnesota and from the University of California at San Diego in the 1970s, they uh, flying uh, an infrared telescope on the Colbert Airborne Observatory, and they unexpectedly discover whole series of infrared lines, which no one have seen before. And these are called unidentified infrared emission bands. Now, actually, these bands may be unfamiliar to astronomers. They were well known by chemists. The chemists have been studying the uh, uh, organic molecules in the laboratory and they know that organic compounds have uh, def definite features in the infrared. So uh, what Dooley and Dave Willems, they identify these bands as due to the stretching and bending modes of aromatic compounds. So this I show an example of these uh, bands uh, uh, they are primarily at 3.3, 6.2, 7.7, 8.6, and 8.3 microns from a planetary nebula uh, called NGC 727. These, uh, these bands are extremely bright and they are, well, I mean, roughly speaking, we know that they are coming from uh, or, uh, organic compounds or aromatic compounds. Or, um, aromatic compounds are ring-like compounds like benzene, they have a ring-like structure, and when these uh, 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 carbon and hydrogen atoms on the on the ring where they stretch and bend, they create these infrared bands. So now the interesting thing is that well, when did that happen? Because when we look at an old star like a red giant, we don't see these bands. And all of a sudden, uh, during the last 20,000 years of the star's life, all these uh, 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 infrared bands, or organic compounds, uh, appeared. So it's very strange that things can happen so quickly. So that occurred to me that the way to look at it is to look at the 
stellar evolution between the red giant and planetary nebulae. And that was a phase of evolution which was never was known, no example were known of these transition objects. Now, I don't have time to go through the details, but in the 1990s, uh, Bruce Rivnek and I, uh, using uh, infrared and other telescopes, discover uh, over 30 of these uh, missing link objects. And here I show five of these, uh, what we call protoplanetary nebulae, uh, pictures taken by us by the, uh, uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, and those of five objects are all discovered by us. So, so it's uh, uh, very interesting that uh, well, after we discover these objects, we can of course do uh, astronomical observations using of including infrared spectroscopy. Then we discover that in addition to these uh, signatures of aromatic compounds, we also found signatures of aliphatic compounds. So what are aliphatic compounds? Aliphatic compounds are chain-like molecules which are a makeup of uh, biomolecules such as lipids. And so, so in the fat that in our body, they are mostly aliphatic compounds. And this is an example of uh, some aliphatic features that we discovered with the uh, uh, our observations. So now, <laughs> even more remarkable is these unidentified infrared emission features are not only seen in stars in our own galaxy, they are seen in galaxies far away. Actually, they are seen by in galaxies as far as 10 billion light years ago, which means that 10 billion years ago, we already have organic compounds in the universe. And not only that, they, are, they have so much organic compounds that as much as 20% of the entire luminosity of the galaxy can come out from those infrared bands. Now, so the most important question is that what exactly are these organic compounds. And uh, well, it turns out they are very similar to kerogen. Now kerogen is uh, a reservoir of uh, a precursors of uh, coal and oil, and uh, they were uh, deposited uh, by as a result of the uh, decay of the remnants of plants and animals. And they have a structure looking something like this. The, uh, the dark areas are aromatic rings and the lines are chains. So it's a very compli complicated organic compound. Now, actually, contrary to uh, expectations, you know, the, uh, the Earth has a lot of organics, but most of the organics are not in living organisms. Actually, most of them are in dead or living organisms, namely in the case of kerogen. Kerogen carries the uh, most of the uh, organic matter on Earth. So our theory uh, in the paper published uh, by us in Nature in 19, 2021 is the structure of these organics in the form as shown as in this example of this uh, chemical schematic. So it has hydrogen and carbon. It also have other elements like sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen, and they have a mix of uh, aromatic and aliphatic structures. So we call this uh, model the Moon model, saying for mixed aromatic, aliphatic, organic nanoparticles. So now the question is that if stars are making these compounds and they are spreading them all over the galaxy, and uh, well, could there be some remnants of those stellar organics in our solar system? Now it turns out the answer is yes. Now the solar system are filled with solids, which we have known for over a couple hundred years. We have the planets, uh, the four in the planets are made up solid. We have uh, interplanetary dust particles. We have uh, asteroids and comets, and we can see this uh, uh, interplanetary uh, solids coming uh, 
into the atmosphere and they create the beautiful site of meteors and meteor showers. And uh, sometimes they were so, so spectacular, they, uh, they are brighter than any of the planets that uh, in the form of fireball. And then furthermore, uh, not everything is burned up in the atmosphere. Some are uh, left and hit the earth and that is in the form of meteorites. So we have meteorites uh, being discovered all the time uh, on earth and we estimate it every year, 40,000 tons of uh, meteorites or micrometeorites uh, fall, on, fall on the earth. Now, the good thing about meteorites is that we can look at them, we can dissect them, we can put them in the laboratory, we can study them by spectroscopy, we can use all kinds of laboratory techniques to analyze their content. Now, the interesting thing is that beginning in the 1960s, they were discovered there are lots of organics in some of these meteorites. Now, what kind of organics? Actually, <laughs> every kind of organics, <laughs> every kind of organics known by chemists have been found in meteorites. And not only everything, actually more. For example, our body uses uh, living organisms on Earth using 20 amino acids and in the meteorites, we have identified over 100 amino acids. In our body, we use uh, uh, five uh, uh, nuclear acids, and there are more nuclear acids there that we did not know about in meteorites. So, so definitely, these organics are not the result of contamination because they are different from uh, they are, they are more than the organics that we have on Earth. So these must have been created uh, non-biologically. So I mean, another piece of evidence is that the amino acids or protein that we have on Earth, on Earth are left-handed, and in the meteorites, we have amino acids of both right and left hand. And in the, so, so these are evidence that uh, that uh, uh, organics are being made by nature using a biological means. Now, most of these organics in the, in the, in the meteorite are found in something called uh, insoluble organic matter. And uh, these are, this kind of, uh, uh, that, that the, this, uh, uh, in, uh, insoluble organic compounds have a very complicated structure. And then after later, we look at other solar system objects like comets. They are also similar kind of organics in comets. Now, for a long time, you must have heard that uh, oh, people call the comets uh, uh, dirty snow, snowballs, but now we know that uh, uh, comets are much more than that. They have uh, they have uh, a lot of organics in them, and these organics are similar to the uh, uh, insoluble organic matter that are found in meteorites. Now you can we can use a high flying aircraft, for example, U two plane, fly to the fly to the upper atmosphere and collect uh, these uh, fine particles in the earth upper atmosphere, which are called interplanetary dust particles. And uh, you can bring them back on Earth. You can put in the laboratory and analyze the chemical content. And interestingly, you do the spectroscopy of this uh, compound. They, are, they show features which are similar to the features seen in the proprietary nebulae that we discovered. Now, Titan is a, is a moon of Saturn. And uh, the uh, Cassini Huygens mission went to Titan and uh, landed on the surface. In the process, they discovered that the Titan is filled with organics. Now, they are in sand dunes, they are in lakes, and uh, actually, so much organics are in the atmosphere, in the surface of Titan that 
the total amount of hydrocarbons is much larger than the total oil and gas reserve on Earth. So, now the, uh, just not that long ago, the, uh, the New Horizon spacecraft fly to the uh, uh, outer solar system and uh, take a look at Pluto. The Pluto also now believed to have its surface covered by organics. So now, well, how do these uh, organics relate to life? So we know that our all different organisms on Earth, they need proteins, amino uh, acids, we need nuclear acids, uh, and their DNA, RNA, and they need uh, uh, fat, and all these things are now known to be made by nature uh, quite efficiently uh, without the process of life. So the ingredients of life can be made uh, without uh, from uh, purely chemical means. So now, just 50 years ago, the, uh, the uh, conventional belief is that uh, well, when the solar system was formed, is uh, well mixed, you have some atoms and ions and, and, they, uh, and uh, they are more like a furnace and the, uh, the rocks and the planets are formed uh, all in this uh, primordial solar system. Now we are not so sure because we now know that uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, stars can make all kinds of minerals and organics. So when the solar system was formed, it probably inherited some of this uh, stellar material. So that's the new idea. So in the past 20, 30 years, so we have completely opened up a new frontier, which is organic matter in the universe. Now the complex organics are found in the solar system. They're found in comets, asteroids, planetary satellites like Titan. They're found in meteorites. They're found in, in the planetary dust particles. And uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, in the, uh, separately, we also found that uh, these com complex organics are made by stars. Now we can hypothesize there's some connections between the two. Now this is a very surprising development, They're totally unpredicted, because like Aristotle, who believed the universe, uh, uh, separate into two regimes. One is the celestial regime, where everything is pure and simple and constant. And another part is the terrestrial regime, where it consists of the Earth, for example, which is mighty and unpredictable and changeable. And uh, so many astronomers uh, very much follow the uh, pathway of Aristotle, saying the universe is simple simple meaning that we have make up stars and at most some simple gases material. Now it is very different from the solar system, which is complex and dirty. Now we are not so sure about this distinction anymore. As I mentioned, the, uh, the universe is, has far more than just stars and gases. It's now known to have complex organics. These complex organics are everywhere. Well, we have them on Earth, but on everything organics on Earth are the result of life. And we have the organics in the solar system. They, we, have found, we first found them in meteorites and we now find them in comets and asteroids. And we see them in stars. And not only in stars, they are made in, seem to be being made in stars. But they are also the signatures of these organics are seen in galaxies. Not only, they are not just a little bit of organics, they're huge amount of organics, because in some peculiar galaxies, up to 20% of the total energy of the galaxy are emitted by these organics. And these galaxies 
we're far away and that so tells us that uh, as early as 10 billion years ago, the universe was already making organics. So this is our theory. So old red giant stars, the and planetary nebulae, they first make carbon and they make simple uh, molecules like C2, C3, CN, CO, HCN, HC3N, C2H2, uh, acetylene, for example. And then they also uh, get these molecules together to, mo to make minerals. And not only minerals, but also complex organics. This stuff, the molecules, the minerals, and organics, they were ejected by the star in the form of a stellar wind. These stellar winds distribute this material all over the Milky Way galaxy. Some of this uh, stuff accumulated into interstellar clouds. These interstellar clouds later collapse into solar systems of which planets are formed. So we have a situation where the Earth may have benefited from the delivery of these complex organics during the early stage of its life. And out of these complex organics, that maybe somehow, we still don't know how, that life originated. Now this uh, does not solve the problem of origin of life. It only makes the suggestion that the origin of life may be easier than the, the process of origin of life may be easier than we previously thought and may be more common than we previously thought. Because if this process can happen on Earth, it could have easily happened elsewhere in the galaxy. So in summary, I want to leave you with a couple messages, uh, all uh, due to the development in the last uh, 20, 30 years. So we now know, which were totally unexpected, that very old stars are able to synthesize complex organics and inorganic compounds such as minerals. These stars, they have very powerful stellar winds they eject this stuff all over the Milky Way galaxies. And these similar complex organics are also present in the solar system. We are now finding them in comets, in asteroids, in the planetary dust particles, in planetary satellites, and so on. So the hypothesis is that could this stardust contributed to the origin of life on Earth. So for some of you who are technically uh, oriented, you may want to uh, read some of these uh, technical articles, which uh, uh, will uh, explain in much further detail uh, what I'm talking about in this uh, talk. Now, I also written a book called uh, Stardust, the Comic Seeds of Life, uh, about this hypothesis. Now, this talk is a very, very uh, small fraction of the uh, material that I cover in the book. I mean, obviously, in 45 minutes, I can't uh, give as much detail as is possible in a book. But if you are interested, you are welcome to get this book published by Springer and uh, which uh, discuss not only the uh, uh, origin of life, but the details of uh, the discovery of organics in the, and how it might have uh, an effect on the uh, origin of life on Earth. That's all I want to talk about today and thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you, Sun, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, if you have any questions for the speaker, I invite you to uh, pose them in the chat box uh, in YouTube. Um, so could you say a little bit more about what uh, new evidence might have emerged from the Hayabusa 2 mission uh, 
That was, um, I believe oh, they yes. recovered some oh, samples yes. from an asteroid. Right, right. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I mean, I uh, I didn't have time to talk about asteroids. Now, the good thing about uh, the, the, the companies that in the past, we first rely on remote observations, it means using the telescopes. Then we have in situ measurements, like going to Titan, we have instruments carried on the spacecraft, even on the lander, we can analyze the contents uh, in, in situ. Now, even better <laughs> is the sample return. So, so sample return, we have sample return going to a comet, we have now sample return going to asteroids, and we bring them, bring back the material which can put to all kinds of analysis in the laboratory. Now, to put a very simple story, uh, a long story short, is that there are organics everywhere. Now, the degree of complexities are different. So not necessarily every site has the same degree of complexity, but uh, they, they, are, they, they all, all these sample return missions have found evidence of organics. Okay, and what, what is the most complex organic compound that we have detected in space? Do we see anything like a polypeptide chain that might be precursor? Of course, of protein? course, of course. <laughs> the best case is in the case of meteorites, okay? So uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, molecule, uh, organic molecules have been identified in a laboratory and they cover every category of organic compounds. So, so they, I mean, when, they, when, when, when we say we can characterize it, we can say we, we can name the chemical formula and that is not really that complex because even they have 50, 100 more, uh, atoms, they're, they're still uh, uh, identifiable. So all, all of this have been identified, okay? Now, when, I, when you, you ask me the question of complexity, the most complex are the ones that I'm describing earlier, which consists of thousands of carbon atoms. Those are, uh, they are in the, for example, in the uh, insoluble uh, organic matter in, in meteoroid. So, so, so there are varying degree of complexity. And, and uh, my, my message is that every biochemical uh, molecule that we have known on Earth have been seen in meteorites and more. So, for example, we use 20 amino acids and over 100 amino acids have been detected in meteorites. Um, if these organic molecules were delivered to Earth uh, during these meteorite bombardments, uh, doesn't the re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere heat these uh, meteorites up sufficiently to destroy these uh, organic no. molecules? No, no, we, 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 can, we can hold them in our hands. Yeah, no, yeah, well, I mean, you, you put the stuff in the lab. I mean, of course, a lot of them were destroyed, but a lot of them are not destroyed. I mean, the best evidence is that you can hold them in your hand. <laughs> it's nothing better than that. And you discover them, I mean, the micrometeroids are easily identified, discovered in, in the Antarctic, for example, you just pick them up. You talked about the sand dunes of Titan. Are those real sand, silicate sand? That oh, we no, have no, 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 no. When I say it, it's organic sand. Organic sand, okay. Yeah, yeah. They just look like sand dunes. Okay, but that, that's really amazing that we have things that look like sand dunes made of organic compounds. Yes, but like, like I said, the total amount of hydrocarbons on Titan is far more than what we have on Earth. Um, another question is, um, life on Earth uh, features molecules of definite handedness. Yes. Uh, do we also see this in molecules in space no. and in meteorites? No, actually I mentioned that. Uh, all, all our uh, amino acids are left-handed on Earth uh, in all living organisms, but in meteorites we have amino acids of both right and left hand handedness. So, so that tells us that whatever we see there 
is not due to the contamination of life on Earth. They were made abiologically. No, I seem to recall that the Murchison meteorite did show some chirality. Yes, they, 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 yes they some slight preference, but the key thing is that both are present. And we don't understand why Earth, uh, the living organisms on Earth, have uh, somehow resulted in only a single uh, uh, left-handedness. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, the audience, this is your last chance to ask questions. Okay, uh, if not, then, uh, uh, so thank you, Sun. Uh, I guess we can just virtually applaud Sun for this very nice uh, and interesting seminar. Yeah, thank you, Stan. Okay, so um, this concludes our seminar Saturday morning uh, lecture series for this season. Please uh, continue to check our website. We'll be arranging another set of lectures for the fall starting in uh, the latter part of September. So hope to see you all then. Thank you all for coming.